Hey, what's going on? It's Dave Duford here at Final Expense Agent Mentor, where I help agents like you succeed in the final expense insurance business. And the purpose of today's video is twofold. So first of all, I'm making some uh, format changes to my YouTube channel, of which I'm going to implement over the next uh, couple of months. Nothing too major. I'm still going to do your uh, regular and expected final expense sales training type videos. But what I'm going to start adding are some more broader based videos targeted towards insurance agents in general and to uh, also investigate and find successful agents and bring you their stories on how they've been successful as well as, in my opinion, rehabilitate some of the classical training in insurance that for whatever reason has kind of been lost to a large public uh, viewership of in insurance agents. In fact, for example, this video I'm going to show you today uh, uh, exemplifies kind of what I find to be a bit embarrassing, at least on my behalf. Um, a guy named Norman Levine, you may have heard of him if you've been around for a while. He is a uh, insurance salesperson, uh, trainer, motivational trainer, uh, has had enormous success in the insurance business, and um, found his video. Um, and unfortunately found that <laughs> I have more views on some of my videos. A guy who sits in his basement talking about burial insurance uh, and uh, wanted to uh, promote some of uh, his good work, which, like I said, unfortunately has been kind of lost uh, to the uh, large, uh, full public view. Um, they're just, as you probably know, maybe one of the reasons you're on my channel is there's just not a lot of insurance quality insurance sales training out there. And a lot of people, I believe, uh, fail this business that could succeed had they had the right mentorship and the right training at their fingertips. And one of my uh, new directions with my channel is to undo that as much as possible, not just as I've been doing in the final expense business, but also writ large in the insurance business. I want to bring up uh, successful classical sales training because it's all essentially the same thing. Certainly things have changed with the digital era as it comes to prospecting and presenting, but ultimately sales is sales after all, right? And I want to bring up some of these, these, these training uh, trainers that were great in their heydays 20, 30, 40 plus years ago and uh, bring them back in front of you because uh, they are ec excellent resources and should not be forgotten. It's even sad uh, a lot of these guys wrote books that are very good, they're timeless, and you can barely find them anywhere on Amazon, even eBay. I found a classic John Savage book uh, called The Easy Sale, I believe it is. I've heard about it before. I ordered it yesterday. It's 25 bucks, and it's literally like a 1975 edition. I mean, it looks like something out of the retro 70s era, but hopefully you get my point. Uh, I don't want to stray too off course here, but one of the directions I'm going to go in is bringing this kind of training material to you. So without further ado, uh, this is about a 20 minute video uh, from Norman Levine. Um, I also recommend that you pick up um, this book here, uh, The uh, Greatest Insurance Stories Ever Told. You can find it on the MDRT website. Again, guys who've been in the business forever. Uh, Norm Levine in this video talks about staying motivated, uh, specifically for those agents who have seen success. It's actually really good and and caused me to think and, and consider some factors as well in my own career as somebody who is, I would consider, midstream in the, in the insurance business. So um, if you're looking for motivational training and as it relates to insurance agents, this is perfect. And I uh, hope you enjoy it. So it's coming up right now. He plays pretty well. And maybe he's still among the leaders of secondary. Well, he goes to sleep that night and he's practically can't sleep. My God, what am I doing here? I don't belong. I'm not, I belong 32nd. What am I doing here in the top five? And he gets up the third day and he gets up on Sunday for the finals and somewhere along the line, <laughs> he chokes. And he ends up right where he ought to be, 35. And he actually sleeps better that night, 35th, than he did when he was first. Because I don't belong number one. Well, that's wrong, you do. The nice thing about our business is we're not in a sprint. You don't have to finish first to win. It's like a marathon, all you gotta do is finish. You finish a marathon, you're a winner. What I'm respectfully suggesting is everybody that hears my voice that wants to be number one in that context can be number one. You can be the best you on this entire planet. The price is change. You've got to get yourself to get up and do the things 
you might not otherwise do because you're prepared to pay the price to be what you say you really want to be. Let me take that one step further. A lot of you have come to me individually, because I know most of you in the audience today. Most of you have come to me individually and said, Norman, I'm not as ambitious as you. I, I don't want to be that big. I've got a wife or a husband I care a great deal about. I've got children that I'd like to give some time to. I don't need the biggest car. I don't need the biggest house. Now, with time, many of those excuses have deteriorated, and a lot of people have changed their mind about it, but I've heard it over and over again. But let me suggest something to you. I have never intended to mess up anybody's life by encouraging success in this business. I'm in trying to enhance it. I do not believe, and I've got lots of evidence to prove it, that successful people pay a price with bad homes or bad families or bad community relationships. Quite the contrary. The greatest human beings I know on this planet are frequently highly successful people, many of them in the insurance business, who have fantastic family lives and who are active in their community and who are making a significant contribution. There is nothing exclusive about being successful and being a whole person. As a matter of fact, the Million Dollar Roundtable's theme, being a whole person, is the common denominator of most successful people. The trick, however, is to compartmentalize your life. Most people can't do that. Most people don't realize there are at least four different parts of each of our lives. Family is probably number one if you're a family person and you've got a spouse and kids. Your career is certainly up there, maybe number two. Involvement is number three. I know about Little League and the Rotary and the Kiwanis and the Chamber and the industry. I've done all of it. I understand that, and that's important. And the charitable work you do is important. That's number three. And four would be fun. How about some recreation, Norm? How about doing the skiing, the golf, and the tennis? Of course. The trick is to put them into compartments and not take from any one of them for the other. But that's a two-way street. That means when you work, you work. And when you play, you play. And when you're active in the community, you do that, but you make time parameters for it. And you religiously live by them. If you start a week and you don't have family time on your weekly activity sheet, shame on you. If you're not giving time to your wife and kids, you're cheating. If you're not giving time to your community and putting something back, you're cheating. They're not mutually exclusive. But the trick is to see, keep them separate. There's a time to work, and it doesn't take that much. Even if you're a workaholic and you're doing 50 hours a week or 60 a week, which many people in our business do, that still leaves 120, 130 hours for everything else. You will never work half the time. Nobody ever does. There's lots of time for family, and there are many things you can do in our business that involves the family. And I'd like to brag a little. I've got three kids. They were with me every inch of the way as, we grew, as they grew up. They went to meetings with me and we went playing together and we spent time together. If they were resenting what I was doing, if they had any resentment in their soul, you would have presumed they would have hated this business. Let me respectfully suggest with pride that I have three kids and all three are in the life insurance business and I didn't ask one of them to come in. They watched what I did and they liked it. Now, if that says resentment, then there's something wrong with my three kids, and I don't think there is. Now, let me respectfully suggest, having said that, that applies to everything. But let me tell you where people get into trouble. They allow one compartment to bleed into the other. For example, I know people that have bought a house. Very excited. Boy, I'm buying a house, Norm. They actually practically build it. They're out there checking it every day. And for six months, they're out of the life insurance business. They're in the construction business. Or something goes wrong. Health, marriage, finances. You know, show business has an expression, the show must go on. How would you feel if you had a physician that took six months off because he was having a spat with his girlfriend or his boyfriend? I mean, it doesn't work that way. You're entitled to have problems in any one of those compartments. You're entitled to have victories in any one of those compartments. But as I said earlier, 
And I mean this. If you can have success and victory in your career compartment, it will favorably impact on everything else, but you can't allow any of the problems in any compartment to give you an excuse for not performing admirably in each area. Your family deserves you no matter how tough it is at business. Your business deserves you when you're working with a positive mental attitude. And yes, the show must go on. Let me give you a perfect example. One of the industry heroes, a guy I absolutely love, Woody Woodson. Everybody in this room probably heard about him. Everyone that's watching me on video, many of them have heard about him. Written the back page for the Life Association News for years. A past chairman of the American General Life Insurance Company. Started practically as a stockroom clerk and worked his way up to become chairman of one of the largest life insurance institutions on this planet. Reached the age of 70. Spoke at the Million Dollar Roundtable. Got up at the Million Dollar Roundtable as chairman of the American General Life Insurance Companies at 70 years of age and spoke to 6,000 top producers and said, my friends, I am here today as a fraud. I'm chairman of a company. I'll be back next year because I'm retiring an honest person. I'm going to qualify as a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable provisional applicant next year. 70 years of age. He did, in fact, retire at that age, and then he went to work selling life insurance. He called me up in November or December of that year, all excited. Norman, I did it! I said, you did what, Woody? He said, I did it! I made round table. I said, congratulations. Now, some of you know you have to be sponsored into the round table, and he gave me a great, great honor. Calling from Houston, Texas, he said, Norman, I'd like you to be my sponsor on my application for Million Dollar Round Table. Will you sign my application? I said, Woody, it'll be an honor. Obviously, there are a lot of people in Houston who could have done it in two seconds. He sent it to me. I signed it. I was Woody's sponsor. Next year, he spoke at the Million Dollar Round Table. And he said, I tell you what, this time I'm here as a provisional applicant. I'm going to become a life member. He's 70 years of age. Six consecutive years he's just accepted the challenge. And he went out to do it. Made it the second year. Made it the third year. Got to the fourth year. He had been married for over 50 years. And his wife, for over 50 years, died in February. Now you talk about compartment spilling. This busted Woody up as it would of you or me or anybody else. I didn't see Woody till the Million Dollar Roundtable that year. June came. I called to express my condolences, but I hadn't seen him. Saw him at the Million Dollar Roundtable, sat down with him. How's it going, Woody? And this matured man, who I'd never seen anything but positive his entire life, his eyes welled with tears, and he said, Norman, frankly, it's terrible. He said, ever since she's gone, life has not been the same. I said, come on, Woody, snap out of it. He said, Norman, don't do that. And he literally, he started crying. I said, well, how about business? Trying to change the stuff. He said, business, who cares? Haven't written a case since she died. Wrote one in January to heck with it. I said, Woody, you said you wanted to become a life member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. He said, Norman, it doesn't matter anymore. I've proven it. My age, I went out and sold. What do I care about that for? Well... I didn't see him again until September. I got off his back, saw him in September at the National Association of Life Underwriters meeting. Woody, how's it going? This time, no tears. He said, oh, Norman, things aren't the same. It's not the same, but a little better. I moved in with my daughter, and uh, things are better than they were, but not very good. I just don't feel like it. I said, Woody, how's the round table coming, Abe? How's production? He said, I told you, I haven't done it. I haven't done a case since she died. Doesn't matter. Spilling over. Well, maybe with justification tough time. I said, I tell you what, Woody, I don't believe it. You made a commitment. You were going to be a life member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. You've made it for four years. You've got two to go. If you break the code now, you're not going to be able to make it in less than 10. That's not the Woody Woodson I know. You can make Roundtable. He said, Norman, it doesn't matter. I said, you're in my unit. I'm going to start calling you or writing you every two weeks from this point forward. And I did. Called him every week or two, and he never acknowledged something was going on. But I kept saying, Woody, come on, snap out of it. Compartments, you know, you talked about that. This is your career. Let's go do it. Got no reaction from him. But he didn't tell me to stop calling either. So I kept calling, kept writing. Got down to Christmas that year. Remember, in September, 70-some-year-old guy, recently lost a wife, one case in January, nothing in the bank, starting cold turkey. My phone rang around December, guy on the other end of the phone laughing hysterically. Ha, 
doing, Mom? What are you here? I said, how you doing, Woody? He said, fantastic. I said, what happened? He said, I haven't told anybody. I haven't told my general agent. I haven't told my daughter who I'm living with. But I just placed the case and made round table. He had done over 25 lives from September to December at that age, having recently been widowed because he had the guts to pull it together and keep his compartment separate. He went on from that moment, not only to make round table that year for the fourth consecutive year, he's made it every year since. He's a life and qualifying member of the million dollar round table, pushing, I guess he's over 80 now. And if a guy can do it in three months with that, I don't understand why people with a hangnail sometimes have to take six months off from this business in order to recuperate. It's attitude, it's compartments, and it's how it works. Well, where does all this bring us? I'm going to quickly summarize the bottom line, gang. There are three components that make successful people successful in our business. And I don't know anybody that doesn't do well at all three if they're successful. You've heard these before, perhaps. They're in my books or on some of my other tapes. I'm asking you, please, to open your mind and listen again because I'm going to say to you that everybody in this room, and I don't know everyone here, and I don't know everyone that's watching it on video, but I've met thousands of people. Every person I have ever met has been naturally weak in one of the three things because nobody I have ever met started out life with God-given gifts in all three. They include the capacity to see enough people under favorable circumstances, and what I do to symbolize that is I use the letter A for activity. The instinct to see a lot of people. The second of these requirements is skill. What do you say when you see the people? How do you do it? How do you communicate? Verbal and nonverbal. How much power do you have in your system? What is your natural skill in prospecting, contacting, fact-finding, and closing? And the third isn't given to you, but the instinct to do it is given to you, and that's to study knowledge. Now, I don't know anyone, and I know all of the greats. I'm blessed with a lot of good friends because of my many years in this business. I don't know anyone who started out in life naturally gifted in all three areas. As a matter of fact, in many ways, they're mutually exclusive. And I've frequently made this statement. I'll make it again. A new person will come into the office. and will say, no, man, I'm a natural-born salesman. I don't need training. I don't need education. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm gone. I can sell. I'm gone. And they walk in, and they're gone. They don't know what they're doing. They're out there talking to people. They can't read a rate book. They can't do anything. They don't know what they're doing, but they're gone. Natural salesmen. But they don't know what they're doing. Someone else will come in with an absolutely opposite instinct. And they'll say, no man, you've got to understand, I will not go out and see anybody and be embarrassed until I know all there is to know. I'm going to study and prepare, and when I'm ready, I'll go out and see people, but I've got to be educated, and I've got to learn it all. And they'll sit, and they'll read, and they'll read, and they'll read. They won't go near the door. Eventually, they develop an ingrown chair. If they got to the door, they couldn't get out anyhow. They do nothing but study. They become technocrats, academicians. And they rationalize it. I'm not going to go see anyone until I'm ready. And the other one says, don't stop me with meetings and education and training. I don't have time for that. I'm a salesman. I got to go. And they are both cutting their throats because until the activity-oriented person learns what the heck they're doing when they get out there, they'll never be great. And I've left skill out, which is in the middle, and most people think they can do it seat of the pants without any training. Now, I'm going to suggest to everyone here in my voice, everyone that's watching me on video, that I don't know you, but I am telling you, unless you're the first person in this world I've ever met, you have a natural weak suit in at least one of those three areas. Either you've got call reluctance or you can't see enough of the right kind of people and you're rationalizing away low activity, or when you get there, you don't precisely know what to say or what to get to do to make people take action and help them solve their problems instead of being chicken and running away from your own. Or three, you hate to study. And that's my weak suit, so I'm an expert on that one. I start reading a page, I know what's on the first line. I know I'm finished with the page because I'm down at the bottom line. I just don't know what happened in between. 
Because my eyes have read, but my brain didn't register. That's my weak suit. And I know it, and I have to work real hard at it. I didn't bother getting my CLU for 23 years because I used to use wisecrack remarks to cover it. Well, if I want a CLU, I'll go out and hire one. But that obviously was just baloney. I was afraid of study. I didn't want to flunk the test. I was bored by reading books, not my style. Well, I'm now addressing everybody in the audience. I'm suggesting to you that if you really want to make a difference, I can help you double your income, not even a reasonable doubt. Double your income in one year. I've done this many, many times with many people. It's not that I've done it, they've done it. First thing you got to do is be honest enough to identify your weakest suit. Is it activity? Are you seeing enough of the right kind of people? Is it what you say when you get there? Skill? Is it? Do you really know what to do? Are you really a great salesperson? Can you close? And we'll spend some time on that. Or do you know what you're talking about? Have you got your credentials, your CLU, your CHFC? And the letters aren't that important. It's knowing enough so that you don't have to educate your prospects or write big fat proposals. It's knowing enough to go out and tell them what to do with authority and know that you're telling them the right thing so you can do it with confidence and then getting them to do it and you do the work for them instead of their having to be educated before they do the work. Now there's some simple examples of everything we're talking about which I'll cover on some of the future sessions. But I want to get to one last story just to make the point of everything we're talking about. Some years ago I spoke, well, not that long actually, in the Philippines. I met a young lady. I've never told this story but it's a fascinating story because if you ever want to hear of somebody breaking out of a comfort zone addressing the compartment problem that we've discussed, setting goals and dreams and aspirations, fighting adversity, this young lady is a classic example. When I first met her, she was a relatively young agent, married, husband in another business. She had three kids. She was at best an average mediocre agent. One of the first people she ever sold was her husband, logical. And she sold him life insurance that required a medical examination. Well, her name was Ballou. But Ballou had her husband examined and got back a flat declination. Because what the medical examiner